Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for every person that's here. Thank you for your, what you want to talk about this morning. If you guys read my weekly email, you saw that uh, we're going to be talking about the pattern of honor this morning. So I'm actually looking forward to seeing how these conversations go. But this is, the idea of honor is something deeply ingrained in the kingdom and in our belief system and in scripture as a whole. And uh, I really want us to chew on that and apply it to our lives. And even as, as soon as I started this lesson, I also had some convictions about areas in my life and people that I, I hadn't treated with the honor that I'm called to treat them with. So even as I'm talking about this stuff, you guys know just like every other thing that I talk about, um, I am working on it too. I am convicted by it too. I have areas in my life that I want to really get this pattern. And like we've talked about before, when we talk about patterns, we could also talk about habits. We could talk about disciplines because whatever, uh, whatever we would consider a habit in our lives is something that's been ingrained into us. And we need to, in order to get better patterns in our lives, we need to ingrain the right things. And that's what discipleship is. That's what the disciplines are. Being a disciple is following Jesus and forming new patterns. The direction you're walking is a new pattern in your life. And it affects everything you do, everything that you think, everything that you talk about. All that you do in your life is affected by your patterns, right? Well, my pattern of honor was actually, in some ways, deeply, deeply ingrained in me. And I've told you guys before, I'm an army brat. So my father was in the military for 20 years. He retired as a lieutenant colonel. And when I was born, he'd already been in the military, drafted for Vietnam. And then the moment that I graduated from high school at 18, he graduated from the military. So my last day was his last day. So I grew up in an atmosphere, in a military atmosphere. From zero to 18, which I think we can all agree is a pretty influential period of our lives, I was, I was surrounded by military. It was, in, it was in our household. It was in our lives. We, we lived in it, and it was all around me. You know, just one example. If you guys know your history, you know General Omar Bradley, right? He's one of the very few, actually one out of nine ever five-star generals. And he was really, really had a really, really important role in World War II. Uh, one of my heroes. And as a child, I got to sit in his lap because... Wow. He invited my family over to hang out at his house. He actually lived, in his later days, he lived at Fort Bliss in El Paso. And he would invite the officers and their children to come over and just hang out with him. And so when I, I went to jun a junior high called Bradley, General Bradley Junior High, and nobody in the school would believe that, that I'd actually met Bradley. They all called me a liar and sent me to the principal. <laughs> it's pretty rude, because it was real. <laughs> So I, I grew up, again, I grew up in this atmosphere. Um, if you guys have ever been on a base, bases are different. They have different rules depending on who's in charge of each base. But the bases that I grew up on, when 5 o'clock hit, they'd have, they'd have a bugle play over all the loudspeakers on base, and that was the point when they were lowering the flag for the day. And that was also the sign that everybody was done with work. And at that point, everything stopped on base. When that hit, everything stopped. People, the guys would stop in the middle of driving and get out of their car and salute. There was an immediate response, and everyone did it. And there was a, a, an incredible response of honor towards the anthem, towards the, towards the flag of the United States, towards what, what they all represented generations of. And then if we go to the movies, growing up going to the movies was a very different experience on a military base. When you go to a movie, you guys see, they always have the announcements about don't make a mess, right? If you go see a movie on a military base, it's insane. It's like you just walked into the worst classroom in a high school. Everyone is completely obnoxious and loud and squealing. Like, I've, at, the, at that time, I thought everybody was adults. Now I'm looking back and realizing they were all a bunch of teenagers. But it was just in, it's just insane. And then the movie, before the movie starts, instead of announcements about throw away your garbage, they have the flag come up. And they play the national anthem. And immediately silence. Everyone pops up to attention and salutes the flag on the screen. There was, there was nobody who was kind of taking their time standing up. There was nobody still talking that somebody would hush. There was no hushing going on. It was immediate that there was a response. When the flag and the anthem began, everyone was at attention, showing honor. 
So this is the culture that I grew up in. I had a great ingrained sense of honor for the flag, for the national anthem, for our history, specifically for our American uh, history of war. You know, I started studying all that stuff when I was just a little kid. And, and I really thought that I would carry on a tradition of military until probably my last year in high school when the first uh, Gulf War happened. That was a point when I th thought, you know what? I don't think I believe in any of this anymore. And I just really got in a more liberal crowd, uh, very much more resistance even in looking at our history from the perspective that I'd grown up in. And there was a real shift in how we view American history, a whole lot less respect for the things that had happened, the things that were represented, and looking more at the faults of what was going on around us. And then by the time I got into college, I was very liberal. And, and all the things that I thought that I was going to grow up and do, I'd really pretty much rejected and rebelled against. But still, all of this was ingrained in me. You know the issues with the athletes who have decided they're not going to salute the flag? When all that stuff happened, it was inconceivable. And I think it's probably inconceivable for anybody else who had grown up like I did, or it, even around the culture that I'd grown up in. You just didn't do that. I mean, you could disagree all you wanted to, but there was an automatic sense of honor when the anthem went off and the flag came up. Because that's who we are, right? Well, that's who I thought we were. But again, this is how we grew up. And I really grew up as a child with, like I said, when, the, when that flag would come up, immediate silence, immediate attention, wherever we were, whatever was going on. And it was almost like I'd stepped into a holy place. It was really like a holy experience. It, was, it, was, it would be sacrilegious to continue talking. It would be sacrilegious to sit, stay sitting down when everybody else was standing up, showing a sense of honor, showing a sense of respect. So that's what I grew up with. Now, if you guys know anything about Japan, or if you don't even, you know that honor is a big deal in Japan, right? I think in American culture, there's a lot of us who, who think there's, it's something really cool about the honor, but we would also say it's a, a, a bit excessive because <laughs> we don't understand it. We don't understand where they're coming from. We see the honor represented in the movies and in, in their media and everything, but when it comes to the point of somebody committing harikiri or seppuku or killing themselves and then we're like oh hello there's something wrong with their sense of honor but to really understand the sense of honor in japan you also have to understand where they come from in their belief system and i think we can actually learn something as we're talking about honor together we could actually learn something from the japanese culture the japanese culture worships their ancestors i'm not encouraging that <laughs> but because they're constantly worshiping their ancestors, their ancestors are always alive among them. Their sense of being is much more long-term and we might even say eternal than our sense of being. And so why is honor such a big deal? Because they today can make a mistake that will completely bring dishonor on all the other generations before them in their ancestry. And all of their ancestors are watching them and not only that, but they will be the ones forever in, in eternity that everyone says they're the ones that screwed up. <laughs> they really sucked and they messed it up. Yeah, for all of us. <laughs> for the previous generations and then all those that come after you will look back with shame on the moment that you brought shame that they still carry. You know, one of the things Sako had to deal with in Beth Shalom in one of her freedom sessions was a huge revelation of the shame she was still carrying in her from losing World War II which she was not even an idea at that point, except in God, you know? But it's huge because they have a much more, e I say eternal, but it's, I, that's the best way that I can think of putting it. They, they have a bigger picture. And really, that's not off. That part's not off. The part about worshiping your ancestors, in some ways, yes, it's off. They're not going to come back here and help you and save your day. That's, that's all God. We worship the Lord. We worship God. We pray to Him. We don't pray to our ancestors. They can't fix a thing. And probably if they're, if they're in heaven, they're probably not paying too much attention to what we're doing here because they're in awe continually. And so with this sense of honor, you know, I have these characters that if you looked at them and understood the language, you'd say honor. But the picture that it's painting is lifting up the name of. And so even going back to uh, our ancestors and our inter-eternal thinking, the decisions that I make will lift up my family name or will bring down my family name. And that has an eternal impact.
right? Are you guys with me? Okay. And scripture says something similar. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. And this scripture brings out the idea which you guys I know you've heard and thought about before. We are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses. We are surrounded by the generations that have come before us. We are interconnected. You know, we are one family by the blood of Jesus Christ, right? We carry one family name by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are intimately and integrally connected and one with every person of faith that came before us. We are connected to Abraham. We are connected to Noah. We are connected to Jesus Christ, of course. We're connected to David. We are connected to all these people we read about. We can look at them and say, well, that's Jewish history. By faith, we are all one family now. The writer of Hebrews is not, he's not literally saying that they're always watching you. That's what the Japanese believe with their worship system. But what he is saying is that they are there and all of their lives have influenced you. And now your life is a continuation of their lives. So live in a way that honors them also. Isn't that wild? So when I go to work or, or when you go to school or whatever you're doing, you're not just representing yourself. You're representing thousands of years of other believers. And not from a distance, but intimately by the blood of Jesus, you're deeply connected with them. We could get very frustrated about the Catholics and their idea of saints. And I think it's very similar to what, what's happened in Japan, worshiping the ancestors and praying to them. We're not supposed to pray to the, the saints, but we are all saints. But I really like the fact that they hold them in such high regard. Because that same way that they hold them in high regard is a sense of honor, is a sense of respect, which we're actually supposed to have for the generation that came before us. And we're supposed to have for one another. I'm supposed to treat you the same way that I would treat St. Paul, St. Timothy, St. John, St. Toa. I am supposed to have the same respect, the same honor, the same, the same lifting up for you that, the, that we might see in like the Catholic Church for their saints. We just don't pray to each other. We only have to pray to the Father through Jesus Christ. They just got a little confused. We have a tendency to do that. But, you know, this is awesome. When you think like that, doesn't it make you want to participate in adding prestige to the family line? You are not far from being a David. And in many ways, I hope each one of you is better than David. You're not far from being Ruth. You're not far from being Esther. All these incredible heroes of the faith, you're not far from being them because you walk with the same blood in you. You walk with the same family name in you. And when we get that into our heads, it will help us also honor one another, honor God and honor the things that God tells us to honor in this life. It's really pretty cool. Imagine walking into a great hall. Have you ever seen one of those castles, like the royal palaces? And they have all the family pictures along the walls. They have, and you can walk through. If you knew your family history, you could walk through. And, and immediately you'd look at this picture and say, I remember this guy's story. And then over here, oh, I remember her story. Oh, she did this. And then there's always that, you know, oh, and Bob. <laughs> he's only up there because he's part of the family, you know. None of us want to be Bob. <laughs> But imagine that sense, the sense of awe that you have walking in that place. And imagine immediately knowing everything that each one of those people did. That's what the kingdom really is like. In heaven, it's going to be like that, except living portraits, real life people. And we're going to walk around and it's not like they're up here and we're down here, there because we're all one together. David is going to be just as impressed by your life as you have ever been impressed by his life. Abraham is going to be just impressed by you as you were ever impressed by him. But there's also going to be a huge sense of honor between us. Exodus 20:12. Honor your father and mother, then you will live a long full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. This is a law like gravity is. Honor your father and mother, then you will live a long full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. It's a command with a promise. And Bible talks about that, doesn't it? It's amazing how many times this one rule, this one law, this one universal law command 
This is like gravity. If you drop your tomato, it will hit the ground. If you honor your parents, you will live a long, full life. You will be blessed. It's a law. But it's amazing how many times this one is actually mentioned in the Bible, in the New Testament. They, they use this example for, as an example over and over again. Jesus talks about it all the time, and it's crazy. And this word honor is actually the word kabed, which comes from another word, kabad. And that kabad is where we get the word glory. So when you see glory, it's the word kabad. And do any of you guys know what the word kabad means? It's not a shish kebab. <laughs> it means glory, but it also means, glory means heavy, heavy. And it's the heavy presence of God. That's what glory is. It's weightiness. If you guys have ever seen Sleepy Hollow, do you remember the guy's name in Sleepy Hollow? The chicken? Ichabod Crane. And Ichabod means the glory has left. Imagine carrying that name. It means no glory. And you guys know the character Ichabod Crane. He's the one that has no glory in that story, right? So kabod means heavy and was most often used to describe the presence of God. When God showed up, things got heavy. When God showed up, there wasn't any, oh, I wonder if God's here today. It was like, oh, you know, when we talk about being slain in the spirit, that's really, a, it's really a manifestation of the presence of God in your life falling to your knees, just feeling, oh my gosh, the presence of God is here. If you guys study the history of revival, even in recent revivals that have happened, almost every time there, there will be some kind of manifestation of a, of a cloud at some point, but also there will be a heavy sense of holiness that when people start walking in, they start <laughs> falling over as soon as they walk in when you study these revivals, you see that people will pull into the parking lot just because they feel like something is going on there. There's the glory of God that's showing up in a more tangible way. That's what revivals are almost always all about. That's how they can be marked in history because you can look back and say, oh my gosh, there was glory at that place. You guys remember the stories of like Moses being shielded from the presence of God. You remember, you remember these stories about this huge boy, oh, 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 and then the silence coming and there's God. God is always surrounded by this thick cloud. And it was horrific, the idea that you could even see him because you would be killed because God is so heavy. It's kind of like when I talked about being a kid in the military, you responded quickly and you honored the flag and you honored the anthem because you were afraid that you'd suddenly simultaneously explode or implode or catch on fire or combust or something because it was such a holy moment and you didn't want to be that guy as a kid, and we were pretty terrible kids, but not at that moment, not at that moment. So how does this play into the word honor? What I'm talking about, this heaviness, how does this play into the word honor? Merriam-Webster's definition of honor is to regard or treat with admiration and respect to give special recognition to. So I've taken their definition, and like I like to do, <laughs> I tweak it a little bit, and I've added our Bible definition of the kabod and the heaviness, and I've come up with, with our definition for today. To give weight to a person or thing. To treat with solemnity and respect as if carrying sacred value and or monumental power. To give weight to a person or thing. To treat with solemnity and respect as if carrying sacred value and or monumental power. Treating something or someone when we're honoring them, we treat them as if they're powerful. So along with this definition, I also want us to include our other key thought. Honor is an eternity position mindset. We will treat people, the appropriate people and things with honor if we can pull back like we learned from the Japanese mindset even and have more of an eternal perspective. Because how we treat things and people has an eternal influence and is part of an eternal story. We get to be part of one family story. God's writing a book, and it's the most magnificent book ever written. And our page is just as important as the first person on the page. The only main character that goes through it is him, God himself, in the form of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So honor is an eternity position mindset. Honor is a major theme in the Bible. Besides honoring your parents, which we've already talked about and is mentioned over and over, if you guys look uh, the weekly email I send out, in that, that email this week, I included all the scriptures 
scriptural references for you guys to look at for each one of these points right here. But you can see over and over again, they sent the idea of honoring your parents is in there. But we're also instructed to honor other things. Honor your government leaders. Honor one another. Honor marriage. Honor your body. Oh, wow. Honor your body. Think about that one. Honor church leaders. And it actually says doubly honor church leaders. So <laughs> just want you to know that. All these other ones, honor, doubly honor your church leaders. It also says only if they're doing a good job, though. So <laughs> I, I let you guys be the judges. But careful because, you know, nobody's supposed to judge, right? <laughs> gentle, gentle. Okay, <laughs> enough on that. <laughs> and of course, honor God. Honor God. So uh, in a moment, we're going to take these ideas and talk about them along with our definition. But God really does help us because he also lists in Scripture, besides, these are each specific Scriptures that say, honor your parents, honor your government leaders, honor one another, honor marriage, honor your body, honor church leaders, honor God, honor Jesus Christ. These are specific Scriptures. You know, I'm not just taking things and tweaking them. It says this. So these are commands to us. But also... The Lord helps us in his, in his amazing thing we call the Bible because he tells us how we can honor God. He says you honor God with your body. He says you honor God with your wealth. He says you honor God with the first of what you produce. You honor God by showing kindness to the needy. So if this is how we show honor, and if we're talking about honor being this, <clears throat> this weightiness, this, uh, this immense respect... If we talk like that, and then we take the illustrations that we have for how we treat God, and then we're supposed to take those to each one of the things we're supposed to honor. So we honor, we honor the Lord with our wealth by tithing and offering, right? We, we honor our government by paying our taxes. How can we honor one another with... I'm not going to judge any y'all. Just tell what you the Bible said. Even Jesus paid his taxes, guys. But how do we honor one another with our wealth? How do we honor one another with what we produce with our lives, right? How about showing kindness? We show kindness to God by showing kindness to needy people. How do we show kindness to one another? How do we meet each other's needs? That's another way to put that. If, we're on, if I'm honoring you, I want to know how can I meet your needs? And then with your body... How can we serve each other physically in a way that honors and lifts each other up? How do I communicate in my body language? How often have you talked to someone and they're saying all the right things, but their body is communicating, I do not honor you? You know what I'm talking about? Our body language communicates honor or doesn't communicate honor. And that comes to worship. You know, we have people who have different views on what you do with your body in worship, but our bodies are as much a part of our worship as our mouths are. And our body language will say, I am worshiping you, Lord, in my heart. I am worshiping you in my heart. And he's saying, your body doesn't tell me that. And I know, but you're just spiritual. You're looking at my heart. Say, <laughs> so, well, I'm actually looking at you in one package, little man. <laughs> okay, I surrender. That's why I worship like this. <laughs> And then after that, the Bible also tells us that honor is. Honor is. It's not only what we give, but something desirable that we receive from the Lord. Honor is the wages or the payment we receive for being humble before God. That's in Proverbs 22, 22 verse 4, Proverbs 29, 23. And we're instructed to seek honor along with glory and immortality by persistently doing good. That's in Romans 2, 7. Isn't that awesome? I mean, we, have, we come from a culture that might even tell you, well, don't pursue honor and glory. No, pursue honor and glory, but do it with the right spirit and the right mindset. It's actually a good thing. You're supposed to pursue it. We give, we seek, we receive honor. We give, we, we seek it, we receive it. This is, we can look at honor as the currency of the kingdom, really. With this kind of language, it's our payment. It's our wages. And we're told to go after it. And we're also told to give it. We are stewards of honor on this earth. We're stewards of our finances. We're steward of honor. We're steward of the things we're given in this life. We're steward of the earth. We're stewards of honor. 
And honors are the, is the wages that we work for. You don't work for your salvation. You don't get more saved by working. You get honor by working. And when we step into eternity, that's where we'll see the wages come. We're going to see it on this earth, but we're also going to see it. How we've stewarded honor here is how we're going to experience it in heaven, which I have no idea what that means or looks like. And these are, this is something we really need to keep chewing on and keep figuring out how do we apply it. But we're also going to do it here together. So what I want to do is, is take the definition that I gave you guys and I want to um, apply it to the areas that we are told to honor. God. These, this isn't debate, so we're not talking about should we honor. It's how do we. And how do we honor the way we've been told also to honor God? Honor means to give weight to a person or thing, to treat with solemnity and respect as if carrying sacred value and or monumental power. It is an eternity positioned mindset. Now, how does that apply to our God, our parents, our government leaders, one another, marriage, body, church leaders? And it's not just about me when I say church leaders. I was joking, though I do appreciate that I'm included in that. This is also about the church leaders of our past. Have we honored them? And this can be a really hard lesson. But there are going to be things as you're thinking about this, as you're talking about it, but also as you continue thinking about this, there are going to be areas in your life that you need to repent. You need to say, God, I am so sorry I did not honor this person in this role that you called me to. Please forgive me and help me to treat that person with weight, as a weighty person, to treat them with solemnity, solemnity and respect, as if they carry, even if... Even if I don't agree with their politics, dun dun, <laughs> they carry sacred value and or monumental power because of the position that they're in. How do I treat them like that, even if I don't agree with them? And that's something we all really need to sort out today when it comes to our politics. I heard this incredible thought from, uh, it was by Bill Johnson, and then it was repeated by Chris Vallotton, and And he talked about how Jesus told us to beware of two kinds of leaven. He said, beware of two kinds of leaven. Beware of the leaven of Herod and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Beware of the leaven of politics and beware of the leaven of religion. Both of them are bad. And if we get caught up in the language of political parties, that we get caught up in the, in the leaven. If we get caught up in the spirit of what's going on around us right now, we get caught up in the leaven. And more than anything, I want to encourage you guys, repent if you had any disrespect in you, any dishonor, and then say, God, I really need you to tell me what to do. I need to stop listening to the people around me. I need to stop listening to the people on the radio and the news reporters and the people on TV, one side or the other. And God, I want your heart. I want to be uninfluenced by the leaven of religion and politics, and I want to go your direction. Okay, let's break into four, five people. And let's talk about these things. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. I bless every one of us that's here today in the name of Jesus Christ. Not only that, I lift up every person that's not here this morning, all the people that are struggling with sickness. Right now, we combine our faith and we say, be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Experience the presence of God now in the name of Jesus. Experience the sickness lifting off. Not only that, but that, that cloak of heaviness coming off in the name of Jesus Christ to be, to be replaced by a garment of praise. And I pray that your glory would fill every person's home in the name of Jesus Christ. They, every person who's not here today would know you are with them. And Lord, I know you're here with us today. Holy Spirit, you're inside of us. And right now we ask that you would flow in us and through us and be in our, in our, in our interaction and leading us in our interaction. May we speak words of wisdom, but also reveal the places inside of us when we converse with one another the places that we need to repent and help us to see through your eyes, think through your thoughts and behave as your children in the name of Jesus Christ. Build, Lord, build, build in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so break into groups of four or five folks and let's talk about some of this stuff. <laughs>